magic whistling powers. I love it. All right. So I am Ian Malott. I am the QC lead here at CART. And so I've heard a lot of validation talks today and yesterday, and I was pretty stoked because that's what I'm talking about. So it's going to be lots of fun. <clears throat> so to get into it, part of what CART does, you've heard a few of our things. So we try to, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yep, no problem. So part of what CART does, you've heard a few of our speakers already, is we work on various projects. And so the project I'm focusing on is one of our major ones. And what that is is we travel to major cities around the world, and we drive around with Garmin cameras in our car, and we map the streets for seven days. And while we do that, we have one person driving, and the other person is navigating and adding in sh missing street names, adding in missing one ways, verifying one ways, adding as much data that we can possibly get on the ground. And then we'll take that coverage back to our office, and our editors will go frame by frame of those images and add in more particular data. And so what we learned after doing this for a couple months and years and all that good stuff is uh, we thought our edits were good, but as we came across older edits that we made, we realized they weren't as good as we initially thought. So we decided to break down a QC process for that so we could double check our work and make sure it's as accurate and pos or as possible. And so we have nine checks overall, and those are naming consistency, surface types, lanes, mainly on tertiary and above roads since those are the higher priority roads, roundabouts, ref tags, destination ref tags, uh, just checking the overall road classifications for an area, uh, validation check, and this is with the JOSM validator since it's got some awesome checks in there, and a routing check just to verify that all of the edits we made are working properly and there aren't any weird issues that will route you down some creepy road. And so with naming consistency, how this works is we'll download our GPS tracks for an entire day and all the data in there. And we'll systematically pan through all of the data and verify each name. And what we're looking for is inconsistencies with names. So we're trying to see if a name should continue, but it doesn't for some reason, or if it randomly stops in the middle of the road when it should continue to the next coming intersection, or if there is any missing names. And what we try to do is we reach out to the community before we go to these areas, and we meet with the government officials to see if we can get any of their uh, street data so we can fill in missing names that we're not able to verify on the ground. And we'll reach out to the local mappers of the area and kind of let them know what we're doing to see if they can assist us in our process there. <clears throat> and so, and this first example, you can see that the street on the left it randomly stops somewhere in the middle of that road, and when it should actually contend or extend to Bison Avenue. And we uh, figured this out because if you look at, I believe it's Shadow Brick Court, so the road just to the right of it, it follows the same pattern as that road. And so we use context clues like this to help justify the changes we make with names. And in this example, you can see that this uh, road in the left picture there is completely missing a name. And so we would just continue that on to fill that gap and complete the street name for that area. And we have our own paint styles that we use for this, and that's why the roads are different colors. It helps us find inconsistencies with the naming, so that could be the spelling, uh, just a simple thing such as a space. And so we have a paint style that we've customized for our, per our processes in order to help us find all these inconsistencies to be able to go in and figure out exactly where it's at and to give the most complete road name for the places we visit. And the next one is surface types. So with surface types, we try to be as specific as possible. Uh, we often come across areas that are just labeled as paved, which paved is good and all, but we like to take it a step further. So we try to be as specific as we can by using asphalt, concrete, paving stones, set, whatever it may be, and we ground verify all of these with our video footage that we took while we were there. 
and we like to be specific because the navigation software often uses uh, our take surface types into account because they're roads that are paved and concrete and all that are usually more safe, reliable, and typically faster roads. <coughs> and so this is another example of our paint style that we use. And we also use the lane and road attributes paint style that's in JAWSM to help us out. But what we did in this one is we uh, have a paint style that highlights the type of surface type on each road if there is a surface type there. So if you can see the road with the blue outline, that is what we styled asphalt roads to be. So as we have this on, we can see any roads that have asphalt. And we made paved this ugly green color so it really stands out. So we can specifically seek those out and re-tag uh, them as the appropriate tag. So this is for a motorway in our hometown. So those would all be asphalt or concrete. And if there isn't a surface type, then the road would just look like it normally does without any kind of outline. And so you can see that in this example where we just have a simple filter to show us any roads that are missing surface types. And with lanes, we like to make our lanes as accurate as possible. And so not only do we add the number of lanes on each road, but we also take it above and beyond and try to add every lane specific feature such as turn lanes, bus lanes, we'll even add cycle lanes. Uh, we add lanes forward and backward if there's an odd number of lanes, just to add as much detail as we can to each street. And we especially focus on turn restrictions, since those play a major role in routing. <clears throat> and so what we'll do is we'll follow our tracks, and we'll double check using filters and our styles to see if there's any lanes on the tertiary and above roads that were somehow missed by us. And we'll go through and verify each one and double check it for all of those things. And with roundabouts. So we used to think roundabouts were super simple because it's just a circular way. Where it's like, hey, you go in, you go around a circle, you get out. Super simple. And then a few months ago, we found out that there's this thing called the circular junction. We're like, wait, what's that? <laughs> and so we uh, had to make this distinction because we came across an area where there was a lot of circular junctions, but not so many roundabouts. But since they looked so similar, we had to figure out the difference. So a roundabout is basically just a circular way where the traffic that is inside the circle has the right of way. And a circular junction is a circular way where incoming traffic has the right of way. So it's this super small difference, but it makes a very big difference when it comes to routing. And so every roundabout we come across, we verify, number one, that it is a roundabout. And two, we double check all the roads that come into it to make sure that the, we call them feedies, so those little connecting roads that hook up to the circle, that those are tagged as roads and not as links because that's a very common error that we come across quite frequently. And then we also double check that if any of those two roads that connect into a roundabout are not sharing a node. Because what that can cause is it can trick your uh, navigation software into thinking that you can bypass the roundabout. <clears throat> and so here is an example. This is a major roundabout change that they made in our hometown. And at first the data was very kind of shocking. As you can see in this, not only is the data very offset and ill-proportioned, but we have that instance where a node was connected to another way and they were sharing the same node, which causes problems. And we have a bit of a mess there. And so after we went through and double-checked this and cleaned it up, so much more pleasing to the eye. And we even added in the service road that was missing if anybody caught that in the first slide. <laughs> All right. And with rep tags, so this is a major part of what we do. Since we travel to larger cities, it's important that the ref network is tagged properly and that it's functioning properly. And so our paint style allows us to see the different road or ref networks for a given area. So we can go through and verify 
all of those and check for any gaps that may be missing. And we also check for inconsistencies. So what we'll often do is we'll look into a country's rep network and how they tag them. So for the US, it's usually simple as like US 50 or I 70 or I 15, something like that. But for other countries, it could be N1 or some other variation. And so we just double check to make sure that we're importing the correct rep network tags. <coughs> and so this is an example of what our paint style does is we have three different ref, oh sorry, four different ref networks going on here. And so we'll go along all of these and look for any gaps that are missing. So these will highlight the entire ref network. And if there's a gap in it, we'll look at that area, compare it to the ref network and add it accordingly. And this is an example of an incorrect ref tag. So this is on a residential road. And residential roads don't really need ref tags. And they also use the name of that road as the ref tag. And so that's an incorrect way to tag it. So we would look for these instances and remove those where necessary. And this is a perfect example of a correct way to tag uh, refs. So they have US 6, US 50, and I-70 business on here, and they separated them with semicolons to indicate that there is more than one ref on that way, but they're not separated. And with the destination ref tags, this plays along with our ref network. So we do these after we verify the initial ref network, just to ensure that we have the correct tags on each ref. And so what we'll do for this is we break it down into two steps. So first we'll check all the links along the ref network to see if they were tagged improperly, just using a ref tag on them instead of a destination ref tag. And so we'll look for all of those and we'll switch those to destination ref tags and verify that they are leading to the correct ref. And then we'll go along each ref network and check for any links that were missed and check all the links that are labeled as destination ref and verify each part of the ref network to make sure all of our tags are correct. So as you can see on this one, this is a case of an incorrect or incorrectly labeled link. So they have just a ref on here and this is a motorway link. And so we would go in and change this to a destination ref and we would verify that it has the correct ref tag. And this is an example of the correct way to do it. So it's also on a motorway link, but they has it, have it labeled as a destination ref, and we verify that the ref tag was leading to the correct highway. So with road classification, this one was a little bit trickier for us to really get our hands dirty with, because at first you kind of understand it, but you don't really understand it until you start driving these different types of road networks. And so we've learned that as we go to more and more areas and constantly drive these areas that it's easier to classify these roads because you understand what kind of traffic uses these roads. And so what we'll do is we'll check all the classifications for a given area and we do it systematically. So we start with the motorway and check that, verify that everything there makes sense and we'll slowly work our way down through trunk and primary and secondary and so on. And what we're looking for is to make sure that one, that the utility of those roads matches the classification that it's currently classified as. And if it doesn't, then we'll adjust it accordingly. And we just go through and clean house, so to speak. But we don't change a whole lot. Usually we're just looking for simple mistakes. So occasionally you'll see uh, roads where it's got a trunk and then it leads into a random primary and then it goes back to a trunk for like a very small segment, like an intersection. And so we just look for inconsistencies like that and clean those up so the road network is intact. <clears throat> and so this is a situation like I was talking about earlier where they have links leading it to a roundabout. And so we would go in and double check all the roundabouts and verify that they have roads leading into them that are the correct classification and not links. And in this scenario, uh, motorways typically don't just randomly start out of nowhere. Usually you have a road that takes you to the motorway. 
And so this trunk road should actually continue until it meets the links that connect you to that motorway. And so we would reclassify that small section of motorway in order to correct the classifications for this section of road. And with our JOSM validation check, so after we've made our first initial edits and made all the changes that we need to, we'll go through our JOSM validation check. And we check everything that affects streets, POIs, buildings, and turn restrictions. And we check POIs just because we like to give the communities we visit a gift here or there. So we pretty much just give them major POIs and we want to make sure that we tag them correctly. And so we'll check that just to make sure we're covering our own uh, backs there. But so with streets, we'll check for all sorts of things. So we're primarily checking to make sure that one, that all the streets are connected, that there's no issues with the lanes, that there aren't any streets crossing over something that doesn't have the proper tagging, like a bridge or a tunnel. <clears throat> and with buildings, we just want to make sure that buildings aren't overlapping each other, since we add POIs every now and then, and more importantly, that they're not overlapping any streets that are in the area. And with our turn restrictions, we're verifying each one that they function properly and that we tag them properly. So I ran into a case a few weeks ago where we had the uh, roles mixed up. So someone accidentally put forward instead of from. So you had a forward via two instead of a from via two. And so the relation wasn't working properly. And so I just had to quickly change the role of that relation and started to function properly. And so with these four areas, this really helps us clean up our data and really makes it look nice. So some examples are right here. This segment of road going under this building, I think this is for a bank. So there's no tunnel tag or the appropriate tagging for this, and so it's a way crossing a building. And so we would check those and make sure that they are tagged properly and that this error is uh, not causing any problems. Oh, we actually came across a tag the other day that would do this. Oh, sorry. So we actually came across a tag the other day that would uh, allow you to tag that. I will have to double check on that and I'll get back to you. So meet with me afterwards and. You know. Right. Covered equals yes. That's it. Uh, you don't need that. Yeah. Yep. No, you're good. Thank you. All right. So in this example, you can see that these two ways are crossing each other, but there is no connecting node. And so we would double check each of these to make sure that there is a connection there if there is supposed to be a connection there. Occasionally, it'll just be a waterway and the road just simply needs a bridge or a tunnel. And so we would double check all of these to make sure that those are accurate to what is on the ground. And in this case, this is an example of the lanes that I was talking about. So the error on this is street with odd number of lanes, but without lanes forward and lanes backward or one way. And so there's three lanes on this street. And so it's a two way road. So we would just simply need to add the lanes forward and the lanes backward to indicate that there are two lanes going in this direction and one lane going in this direction. And that would fix that error for us. And then we do our route check to make sure that all of our turn restrictions are working properly, that there's no weird things going on with the data. And we do two different checks. So we use the OSRM check and ID to check a wide area. So that way we can see our entire day and just quickly skim through and see if there's any odd turns that are allowed or weird gaps. And then we use the GraphView plugin in JOSM to check intersections where we've added a wide amount of uh, turn restrictions. And so as you can see in here, this is an example of the GraphView. So there are two links on the bottom of this picture which should are, which is what you're supposed to take if you're turning right at these or this part of the intersection. And you can see these little arrows there in the intersection that are indicating that you were allowed to make a right turn at the intersection instead of taking the link. And so that is where we would go in and check our restrictions and see if that we, we need to add a restriction or if there's already a restriction there that the members are working properly.
And then with OSRM check, uh, it's a pretty basic navigation thing. We just drop a point in one place and we start dragging it around the major roads to see if there's any inconsistencies. So one thing I found with this is I had a point on a primary road and I was just going through a roundabout and I figured it'd take me right through the roundabout and I'd be good. And instead it took me off into Wonderland and then came right back to that roundabout and then went through. And I was really confused as to what was going on there so I zoomed in, found the data and it turns out part of the roundabout was deleted. And so this is a really good way to find major issues with the data that way so you can go in and correct them. But that is all she wrote. So are there any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm interested in the hardware you used to do the actual recording in your vehicle. Um, so you, you mentioned video. Are uh, you taking a continuous video or are you use it like Raspberry right. or OSC? Yeah, so we use primarily Garmin cameras. So we use primarily Garmin cameras. And we just have them um, sectioned out so they take video and it spaces it out every second so we can go through and just quickly click through the video and be able to add data as needed. But we also use uh, the open street cam, the Waylands, and we contribute to that as well. Yes, sir. So is your initial sort of figuring out what you need to validate, that's all manual and, and from your team on the ground? Yes, sir. So we go through, so we have a few processes. So each editor, after they finish a few sets of videos, they'll go through and they'll go through all of these steps themselves and see what they can fix. And then once an entire day has been done, we'll have one person go through and check the entire day for all of these issues. So we have like two validation steps. <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome, you guys have been great. <laughs>